Professor Noga Lon. Uh, he's, uh, he, 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 he has a position uh, at Tel Aviv University since 1995, uh, where he has worked on various topics related to combinatorics, graph theory, computer science, many things related to randomization, expanders, uh, the randomization, streaming algorithms, information theory, uh, computational geometry, and he has published over 500 papers and one very influential book, The Probabilistic Method, on those topics, um, where he has uh, advised over a dozen PhD students, received many awards, uh, I will maybe skip some, Polia, Bruno, Landauer, the Godel, the Dijkstra Award, the, the very prestigious Israeli prize for the top scientist in Israel. And, uh, and I'm also happy personally because uh, we belong to the same generation. I did my PhD in Israel, and my advisor, my PhD advisor was the same generation, or Micha Perles, the PhD advisor of Noga, which were the fathers of computer science and combined mathematics in Israel, and then produce the next generations which were tremendously influential in the development of modern theoretical computer science and combinatorics. And so we are very happy to have Noga here and continue the collaboration with Israel. A few years ago, we organized the first joint uh, meeting of the mathematical Mexican society and Israeli society in Mexico. And hopefully we will continue uh, fostering the the collaboration with Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, let me thank the organizers uh, uh, for uh, the invitation, uh, for this uh, uh, perfect, uh, uh, perfectly organized uh, meeting. Uh, of course, there is still some room for possible disasters, and uh, this talk may happen to be one of them, but, uh, uh, but I think it's clear that this is a, a very nice uh, conference already. And, uh, uh, and for me, this is a, a first uh, time in, uh, in Mexico City. Uh, it's indeed a very uh, interesting uh, city, and I want also to uh, uh, congratulate you for this uh, 75th uh, uh, anniversary. Uh, Hopefully, uh, for the 100th anniversary, uh, I'll already be able to understand uh, Spanish also. Unfortunately, this is not the case uh, yet, but... Uh, okay, so, uh, so I'll be talking about uh, structure, uh, randomness, and universality in graph theory, and, uh, uh, and I'll explain uh, uh, what I mean by each of these uh, words. Uh, and uh, let me uh, start by uh, uh, telling you what, uh, what's the basic structures that, uh, that I'll consider in this uh, lecture. So, so basically, I'll have graphs. Uh, and all the graphs I will consider will be uh, finite and undirected. I denote always a graph by a pair uh, VE. V will be the set of vertices. E will be the set of edges. So the graph that you see here has uh, five uh, vertices and uh, six edges. Okay, now I want also the notion of a subgraph. So a subgraph is what you see uh, here in uh, red. We just take some of the vertices and some of the edges, and we only have to make sure that what we took is itself a graph, meaning that if I take some edge, then I have to take the two endpoints of it also for my subgraph. So this is just a, an example of subgraph. And then I'll have also the notion of an induced subgraph. By an induced subgraph, we mean that uh, we take some set of vertices and we take all the edges that are spent on these vertices. So all the edges that have both endpoints in uh, uh, the set of vertices that we took. And because of this, the example that we saw before is not induced because uh, this edge, we didn't take it, and, uh, and this one is induced. Okay, so we'll have graphs. 
will have subgraphs and will have induced subgraphs. And now let me t tell you what uh, we mean by a, a universal. So uh, a graph G, we say that it is a universal for some family, and all my families will be a finite, although one can consider the infinite case as well. So it is universal for some family F of graphs if just it contains every member of this family F as a subgraph. Okay, so this is a, it's a universal structure in the sense that it contains every substructure as a subgraph. And a, a basic question that we want to consider, and I'll tell you that this has been considered quite extensively, is to try to find small universal graphs for interesting, given interesting families. So what we want is to determine or estimate the minimum possible number of edges in a universal graph for some interesting family of graphs with at most k vertices. We will get some interesting family, like maybe the set of all planar graphs on k vertices, or all the trees or forests on k vertices, and we want to have something which is pretty sparse, does not contain too many edges, and contain all of them as subgraphs. Okay, so we. So just uh, to tell you something about uh, uh, interesting families that have been considered, and, uh, and I'll not talk about much, but, uh, but mainly just uh, uh, flesh some, uh, uh, some references and some examples. Uh, so quite a lot of people consider sparse universal graphs for forests. We just take graphs with no cycles, right? So these are forests, every connected component is a tree, we look at all forests with at most k vertices, and we want a graph without too many edges that contain all of them as subgraphs. There are lots of results uh, about this, and uh, we understand uh, uh, reasonably well the minimum possible number of edges in uh, uh, such a universal graph. Uh, then uh, another family that has been considered is the family of planar graphs and graphs with small separators now, I'm, some of the things I'll say will just be the buzzwords here, and it's not so important to really understand uh, or know the notions. Uh, so if you know it, it's fine. If you don't, I'll not really use it, but this is just to give you an example it's of uh, the families that have been considered. So there are quite a lot of work about uh, universal graphs for the family of planar graphs and uh, in some more general classes, which are graphs with small separators. Uh, then, a, a simply to describe a, a family, is just the family of all graphs with at most k edges. So we fix the number of edges, and then we can take these k edges and construct maybe a complete graph with about square root k vertices, or take a matching of size k, k edges. All the graphs of k edges, we want something that is relatively sparse and contains all of them. Here is another one. A, uh, graphs with maximum degree at most d. We look at all, all the graphs that have maximum degree at most d. So when d is 2, it will be just collection of cycles and paths. When d is 3 or more, it's uh, more complicated. And, uh, and again, uh, uh, there are quite a lot of papers that uh, try to understand how sparse, how, what is the minimum possible number of edges in a graph that contains all of those uh, is a uh, subgraphs, uh, and uh, uh, so two of the words uh, uh, that, uh, that we had in the title was structure and randomness, and I'll try to tell you what, uh, what I mean by this. So some of the results are proved by considering random graphs. We try to find a sparse graph that contains all subgraphs uh, from some given family, and then uh, we take some model of random graph. Usually, uh, the most common model is a, a so-called erdes reni binomial random graphs. And the reason it's called the erdes reni model is because the model was introduced by uh, Gilbert. And uh, actually, around the same time, it's true that it was a, a very similar model was considered by Erdes and Reni. And, uh, uh, and they indeed uh, proved uh, a lot of things uh, about, uh, about the properties of, uh, of these random graphs. So uh, 
uh, so this is uh, a correct name to, to call it uh, the Erdogan random graphs. And often when, uh, uh, maybe when we don't understand the structure of some problem well enough, then the simplest thing to try to do is just to take random graphs and try to see how good they are for the problems they are considering, we are considering. And, uh, uh, and here is uh, one specific example. So I told you that uh, one class, uh, one family of graphs that has been considered is uh, just a family of all graphs with k edges. So we want to ask, what is the minimum possible number of edges in a graph that contains every graph on k edges as a subgraph? And uh, it turns out, so this was uh, something that we did with uh, uh, Vera Sodi uh, quite some time ago, improving some estimates of uh, Baba Chang, Erdes, uh, Graham, and Spencer. And, uh, uh, and it turns out it's a, a correct minimum possible number of edges in a graph that contains every graph on k vertices uh, with k edges uh, as a subgraph is up to a constant k square over log k square. So in many of the things, uh, the precise constant is not known, but it means that here the, both the lower bound and the upper bound are some constant k square over log k square. And uh, the lower bound is uh, just by uh, some simple counting argument. So just there are many graphs with uh, k edges and we have to contain all of them so by doing some simple counting argument, we show that our universal structure has to contain many edges. And the construction is probabilistic, so it's some version of the erdos rennie random graph, only we don't take the usual random graph where we have labeled vertices and each pair forms an edge randomly and independently with the same probability. Here we really take uh, some log log k blocks of vertices with appropriate sizes, and then the probability with which we put edges between vertices in different blocks depend on the uh, numbers of these blocks. And if we choose all the parameters correctly and we do the computation correctly, it can be shown that uh, we can get a graph with k square over log square k edges that contains every uh, graph on k edges as a subgraph. So this is one example where randomness is, use, is useful. And uh, uh, let me say something about the uh, structure. So some of the results for these questions are actually uh, done by explicit constructions. And again, uh, here I wrote uh, one example. I'll not talk much about it. And this was with uh, uh, Mike Capalbo uh, also quite some time ago. And it turns out that there is some explicit construction of a graph uh, that contains all the graphs on k vertices with maximum degree d as subgraphs, this graph will have a little bit more than k vertices. And the number of edges, which again is optimal up to a, a constant factor, is k to the 2 minus 2 over d. So for example, if d is 3, then we need about k to the 4 thirds edges. And, uh, I'm not going to say uh, much about the construction here, but it's some sort of a product, of an appropriately defined product, of a high girth expanders. So expanders are pseudo-random graphs, which are sparse, but behave in many ways like random graphs. And if they are of high girth, uh, uh, this means that they don't have short cycles. And there are known constructions of such graphs. And, uh, uh, and if we take uh, appropriate uh, graphs of this form and we define some product of them appropriately, then it can be shown that, uh, uh, that this has the right number of edges and, uh, uh, and it contains every graph on k vertices with maximum degree d as a subgraph. Again, the lower bound here is by counting and is relatively simple. It again follows from the fact that we have many graphs on k vertices with uh, maximum degree d. And because we need to contain all of them, then we need to have many edges. So this is about uh, uh, universal graphs. 
And this is what I uh, meant by structure and randomness. But actually, I'll talk more about uh, induced universal graphs. So, uh, so this is a similar notion. Let me tell you what I mean by this. Uh, so this was first considered by uh, Rado in the 60s. And uh, we call now a graph G induced universal, as opposed to universal, what was before universal. So it will be called induced universal, again, for a family of uh, F of graphs, say, if uh, every member of F is now an induced subgraph of the graph. Okay, so, so for example, here you see a graph, and you see that I took here these four red vertices, and I took all the edges that they span. And we will see that uh, uh, there is some, uh, uh, some algorithmic motivation to consider the corresponding question here. And the corresponding question to the one we uh, discussed before, uh, or that I mentioned before, is again, what is the smallest possible size of an induced universal graph for an interesting family F of graphs, an interesting fa uh, finite family, and here, we measure the size by the number of vertices. We don't care how many edges. We want to have a graph that is not too big, does not have too many vertices. And still, every member of the family is an induced subgraph of it. Okay. And let me tell you some uh, reason for, a, uh, for trying to uh, uh, consider this problem or a, for a... Uh, so a possible uh, algorithmic application of it. Uh, and this is something that is called the uh, adjacency labeling schemes. Okay? So what is an L adjacency labeling scheme? So for some family F of given graphs. So this is uh, basically, you can think about it as two algorithms or two functions. Uh, label will be the first of them, of them. So what it gets as input, it gets a graph H from the family, okay? And then it just assigns a label of L bits for every vertex of it. Maybe if the family was a family of planar graphs, you give me a planar graph with K vertices, and then I, or the function label, assigns to each vertex of it a label of L bits, of hopefully not too many bits. And then edge, that's a, a another function or another algorithm, that what it gets, it gets two labels, and then it looks at the two labels, and depending on them, it tells us if the two vertices are adjacent or not. And it's important here that this function or algorithm edge, it only sees the labels. It doesn't know what's the graph edge from which it came, and it uh, doesn't know the identity or the number of the vertices, it just knows the two labels. So if they are adjacent or not, should be just a function of the labels. And you see that this is something that can be useful, right? So if I have an adjacency labeling scheme with a small number of bits, let's say for the family of all planar graphs with most k vertices, then this is an efficient way to store a planar graph in my computer. You will give me a planar graph, I'll apply this uh, a function label. It will tell me which label each vertex uh, gets. And it will be just a few bits to each vertex. And I'll remember just these bits. I don't have to remember anything else. And now if you ask me if vertex number 17 is connected or not to vertex number 23, I just look at the two labels of them. And I apply the second function or the second algorithm edge. And it tells me if they are adjacent or not. So we can store it efficiently, and, uh, and we can still uh, access it. Uh, so, so this was uh, actually a theorem. Uh, it's a simple theorem, but it's uh, very useful, and, uh, and uh, uh, therefore important. So this is by Kahnan, Noor, and Rudish. And what they uh, observed is that a family F has an L-bit adjacency labeling scheme, in the sense that I said, if and only if, there is a universal, an induced universal graph for the family F with at most two to the L vertices. And the proof of this is easy, but let me, uh, let me just say it. So it's basically the two things are the same. You see, if I have an L-bit labeling scheme, 
then I can define for the family F, then I can define a universal graph, namely every label will call every possible label will correspond to a vertex. So we'll have two to the L vertices, all the possibilities of the labels. And then the function edge will tell us which pairs of labels are connected and which not. And, and then you can see that this will be a universal graph, right? Because if we have a graph on the family, there is a way to assign labels to it. So these labels really tell you which vertices you have to take in this universal graph, and they will be connected or not connected exactly because the function edge is doing what it is supposed to, to do. And, and the converse is also true, right? If I have a universal graph, which is relatively small, has two to the L vertices, then the labeling scheme will just be, you, you give me a graph, because my big graph is universal, I find it as an induced subgraph of my universal graph, and the labels will be just the names of the vertices, so just the sequential number of the vertices of this big universal graph. And therefore, this is basically the same, and this is one motivation to consider it. And, and again, let me say something about uh, uh, what has been considered before, uh, or some of the families that have been considered before. Uh, so maybe the most basic case, and about uh, this I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, more later, uh, these are general graphs. So we just take all the undirected graphs on K vertices, and, uh, uh, and we just want a universal graph, so a small graph that contains all of them as induced subgraphs. Okay, so this is general graphs. Then bipartite graphs uh, have also been considered bounded degree planar graphs, uh, forest graphs of arboricity K. Again, I'm saying it's not so essential to, to know what every notion means, so this is just to show that we have many families. Graphs of tree width uh, K, uh, and uh, uh, graphs of uh, maximum degree D, so for a uh, Odd D and for even D, uh, this has been considered uh, separately in graphs excluding a fixed minor and bounded degree outer planar graphs and, uh, and actually uh, some more. And in each of these cases, we have some estimates. So we have some upper bound and lower bound for the smallest possible size of an induced universal graph, namely of a graph that contains each member of this family as an induced subgraph. Now, in some of these cases, uh, the gap between the upper and lower bound is only a constant factor. So, so the two differ only maybe by a factor of 20 or something like this. And, uh, and here I wrote uh, actually all the examples for which uh, we know uh, uh, this uh, minimum possible number of vertices in a graph that contains every member of the corresponding family as induced subgraph up to a constant factor. Uh, so it is known for general graphs and for uh, bipartite graphs. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said, I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, this a little bit uh, more later. It's known for graphs of maximum degree D, for even D, and a little bit more difficult for odd D, but in both cases up to a constant factor, for bounded degree outer planar graphs, and for forests. Uh, now in all these cases, uh, I think I wrote it here. So... There is no non-trivial family among all of those for which the correct constant is known. So there is always a gap, some factor, between the upper and the lower bound. So maybe uh, in some of these cases it's a small factor, maybe two or three. In some cases it's big, it's 30. So we understand it uh, asymptotically up to a constant factor, but we don't know the constant even for things that look simple. So Look at graphs of maximum degree two. So graphs of maximum degree two, these are just graphs that every connected component is either a cycle or a path. It's very simple to understand what is this family, and it's not difficult to show that there, the minimum possible number of vertices of a graph that contains each member as a new subgraph is linear in the number of vertices, is between maybe 1.5K and 2.2K, I'm not sure these are the correct numbers, but something like this is known. And he, even here, although it's 
linear and the construction is rel relatively simple, we still don't know what is the precise constant. So it looks, uh, and, uh, and I'll try to tell you today about, uh, about some results where, uh, where indeed uh, uh, it is possible to determine also the constant. So, uh, so I want to talk a, a, a little bit more about a, uh, indeed one example, a, so this will be one representative example, uh, which may be the most basic case and also the case that has a, the longest history. And this is just the family of all undirected graphs. So we have all the graphs on K vertices and we want the smallest possible size of a graph that contains each graph on K vertices as an induced subgraph. Okay, I want to understand this, and just, uh, uh, so let me denote it here by f of k, little f of k. This will be the minimum number of vertices in an induced universal graph for the family of all k vertex undirected graph. And just to practice the definition, I uh, have here one example, so I want to claim that f of 3 is 5. If I want a graph with the minimum possible number of vertices that contains every graph on three vertices as an induced subgraph, then the minimum possible number of vertices is five. Let's see why this is simple. So it's definitely at least five because I have to contain a triangle, so a complete graph on three vertices. I have to contain an independent set on three vertices, and the two of them can contain only one common vertex because one is complete and one is independent. So, so this is three plus three minus one, which is five. Okay, then uh, why this is an upper bound? Because what you see here is an induced universal graph. Let me show you. So here it contains a, a triangle on three vertices. Here it contains a, a path of length two, right? Uh, here it contains a, a, a graph consisting only one edge and one isolated vertex. And uh, here it contains uh, three independent vertices. And these are all the graphs on uh, three vertices. Now, by now, you probably notice that my uh, PowerPoint skills are very limited. So this actually is going to be the most sophisticated animation you're going to see here. <laughs> let, me, let me show it again. Uh, right, so, okay, so this is a... Uh, okay, so we understand that this uh, f of 3 is, uh, is 5. And we want to understand what happens uh, in general. So, so again, we want the minimum possible number of vertices in a graph that contains every graph on k vertices as an induced subgraph. So Moon showed in, uh, in uh, 65 that this number is at least 2 to the k minus 1 over 2, and at most some constant k times 2 to the k over 2. He had some specific constant a different constant for uh, even k and different constant for odd k by some explicit construction. And uh, uh, so there is a, a still a gap of, uh, of about k. Uh, then there was some a, a paper of Wiesing uh, in the late 60s where he uh, tried to collect uh, what he viewed was uh, interesting uh, problems in graph theory, uh, interesting open problems. and. Uh, and the uh, one problem that he mentions is to, uh, to get better bounds for this uh, f of k. Here is a result of uh, Bolobash and Thomason from the 80s. They don't quite improve f of k, but, uh, but still it's interesting. So they consider the random graph. And by the random graph, uh, I want to, we, we take n labeled vertices. Every pair, randomly and independently, is an edge with probability one half. Okay? And then they can sh could show that if the number of vertices is k squared times 2 to the k over 2, so a little bit more than what we have here, but not much more, then with high probability, this will be universal for the family of all k, to k vertex graphs. With high probability, it will contain uh, all k vertex graphs uh, uh, as induced subgraphs. And it's interesting, so this was in 81. It's kind of before people started uh, to use uh, uh, in probabilistic combinatorics a uh, uh, more sophisticated high uh, deviation inequalities. And it's interesting that they could get this result just by using second moment arguments, so only Chebyshev inequality, basically. Uh, 
And they, but, but then you have to do something clever because, because it's clear that second moment cannot yield good enough estimates to, uh, to work uh, against all graphs. Uh, so they do something. Uh, now later people tried to uh, started using uh, some more sophisticated uh, high deviation inequalities and uh, large deviation inequalities. And, uh, and this estimate for the random graph was improved by uh, Brightwell and Koyakawa. Uh, in the early 90s, and uh, they showed that for the random graph, uh, some constant k times 2 to the k over two vertices suffice. So now it's uh, comparable to the bound we have here. I'll tell you some uh, more precise uh, results about this uh, later. <coughs> and, and then there is this uh, relatively uh, uh, recent uh, uh, nice paper that contains uh, lots of uh, clever ideas by uh, Alstrup, Kaplan, Thor up in week, and they could determine the truth up to a constant factor. So again, we have the lower bound here. They got an upper bound of a, <coughs> which maybe was a, by a factor of 20 or so bigger than the lower bound. A, so it's a graph with, a, uh, I think, 16 times square root 2, something like this, a, times a 2 to the k over 2. A, uh, a vertices that contains every k vertex graph as an induced subgraph. Okay. And, uh, and the new thing is that uh, I want to tell you about is, uh, uh, is really an asymptotic formula. So we can get also the correct constant, uh, and there will be some uh, negligible uh, additive error term. So really the correct value of f of k up to a low order additive term is 2 to the k minus 1 over 2. So it's really the lower bound. And there will be an additive term that uh, uh, will be negligible. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and somehow, as a byproduct of the proof, we will also understand uh, better what is happening for, uh, for random graphs. Uh, so this is what I wrote here. So if we want to know the minimum n so that the random graph gn one half, we take n vertices and every pair forms an edge with probability half, we want the minimum n so that with high probability this graph will be k universal, will contain all k vertex graph as induced subgraph. Then this is, again, up to a low order uh, additive term, k over e times 2 to the k minus 1 over 2. And uh, in fact, something uh, stronger holds. Uh, if we look at the largest, so we look at the random graph, and we ask ourselves what is the largest uh, value of k so that this graph is k universal, then this is always, with high probability, either the value of the maximum clique. You see, it has to contain, among all the graphs on k vertices, it has to contain a clique, complete graph on k vertices. So of course, the k that we have here cannot be bigger than the maximum clique. So what is written here? is that for most values of n with high probability, it's exactly the value of the maximum clique. And for some exceptional values of n, uh, uh, with probability that is bounded away from 0 and 1, then it will be 1 less than the size of the maximum clique. And I should mention here that, uh, and this is somewhat uh, surprising if you haven't seen it before, that if you take the random graph on uh, n vertices, so those are uh, pretty old results by Matula and by uh, Bolobash and Erdes, that say <coughs> that we really know the value of the maximum clique in it, of the maximum co complete subgraph in it, uh, with very high probability. So you take a random graph with uh, 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 10 vertices, so it's big, and then there will be some one specific number that I can compute. Uh, it will be roughly twice the logarithm base 2 of the number of vertices, but there is a formula. And with very high probability, this will be exactly the size of the largest peak. And again, for some exceptional values of n, there will be two possibilities. But, uh, so we understand the size of the largest peak. And something similar will be uh, for the maximum k, for which this random graph is k universal. And then they'll tell you even something a little bit stronger about this. But, uh, OK, so I, so I want to say something about, uh, uh, about proof ideas, because, uh, because I think uh, there is something 
nicer, so it combines uh, uh, some probabilistic uh, arguments and some uh, group theoretic tools that I'll, I'll mention uh, briefly. So, so again, uh, le let me denote by this uh, capital F of K will be the family of all K vertex graphs. Uh, and, uh, and remember that uh, little f of k will be the minimum number of vertices of an induced universal graph for this family. Right? Yeah. And what we want to show, so here is just a, a more explicit statement of, uh, of the theorem. Uh, so this f of k, the lower bound is 2 to the k minus 1 over 2. This was really proved by Moon. And the upper bound is the same, times 1 plus an additive error term, which is the same thing, times log k to three halves over square root k. And the important thing is that this is something that uh, tends to zero as k tends to infinity. Okay. And, uh, and the question is uh, how, uh, how do we prove it? So let me first say something about, uh, about the lower bound. Uh, the lower bound is again counting. So this was done by Moon. It's not difficult. And uh, let's see. So we have this graph uh, G, which contains every graph on k vertices as in U subgraph. Uh, now let n be the number of vertices of G. So it has to contain every member of f of k as a new subgraph. And there are exactly n choose k possibilities to choose k vertices out of n. Right? So even if every k vertices will give me a different graph, I still have to get all of them. So definitely I need that n choose k will be at least the size of f of k, at least the size of the uh, family of graphs that I'm trying to get. And f of k, it's uh, not difficult to see that it's at least 2 to the k choose 2 divided by k factorial, because you first can take k labeled vertices, and then each pair can either be an edge or a non-edge. There are 2 to the k choose 2 possibilities. And then depending on the number of automorphisms of the graph, if the graph has no automorphisms, then we really counted every such graph k factorial times according to the number of ways to place it on the k vertices. In fact, most graphs do not have automorphisms at all. They are rigid. So really, the number of uh, graphs on k vertices is basically the number that you see here. So we need this inequality. And if we solve it, then uh, uh, we get that n is at least 2 to the k minus 1 over 2. Okay. And you see from this argument that equality can hold here. Let's say that we want really equality. So equality will hold here in this left-hand side inequality if every member of this f of k, every graph on k vertices, will be obtained exactly once. So we would have this big graph, and it would contain every graph on k vertices exactly once. Now, this is probably hard to get. I mean, it seems that it's a... Uh, too good to be true, and indeed it can be shown that, it's, uh, that this cannot happen. So in fact, one can prove the following. I'll not say how, it's not difficult. That uh, if we have any graph with exponentially many vertices, and our universal graph has to be uh, with exponentially with two to the, at least two to the k minus one over two vertices. So any such graph contains some subgraphs on k vertices very many times, exponentially many times. In fact, not only one subgraph, but many subgraphs. And it's written here in some complicated way. Well, no, no reason to read it. But just say, so we cannot really hope to get every graph once. Some of them will really, we will get them many times. And if the number of vertices of G is going to be 2 to the k minus 1 over 2, roughly. This is what we are trying to prove. Then, in fact, most members of f, well, they can appear more than once, but they cannot appear more than 2 to the little o of k times. Right? So this is just by counting. Because n choose k will not be much bigger than the total number of graphs. So some graphs must appear exponentially many times, but we want that almost all the graphs will appear a very small number of times, so much smaller than that. OK. So how do we get this? Uh, and, uh, and as I said, if we don't know or when we don't understand the structure of some extremal problems well, then maybe the most natural thing to try is to try random graphs. And uh, this is natural, so, so we can ask ourselves if random graphs can help. And, uh, 
The short answer is uh, no and yes. So there are bad news and good news. Let me uh, show you what's, uh, uh, what's the bad news here. So random graph as it is, is not going to be good because, for example, it's not going to contain a clique of size k if the size of the random graph is only roughly 2 to the k minus 1 over 2, and we compute the expected number of complete graphs on k vertices, then this expected number is going to be very, very small. Because in fact, a random graph of this size will contain a clique only of size k minus, say, 2 log k. So it will be too small. In fact, the same will hold for every graph that we want to get as subgraph that has lots of automorphisms. You see the trouble, why does a random graph not contain a clique of size k? Because the clique has lots of automorphisms, k factorial automorphisms, and that means that when you try to place it in some place in this random graph, there is only one way to place it. Uh, we, we, cannot, uh, we have only one chance to put it on these k vertices, and because of this, there are just not enough possibilities, and the expectation will be low, and with high probability, we will not find it. And, and as I said, the same will hold for every graph that has many automorphisms. But the good news is that, uh, and I wrote it here with the computation, so that if we try to get a k-vertex graph that, let's say, does not have non-trivial non automorphisms at all, so it's just a rigid graph. It doesn't have any automorphism, any non-trivial automorphism. Then the expected number of copies of it that we expect to find in a random graph, let's see the computation here. So there are n choose k ways to choose k vertices. Then there are k factorial possibilities to try to place this graph on these k vertices. And once I decided to place it, then the probability is that all the edges and the non-edges are where we want to find them is exactly 2 to the minus k choose 2, right? One half raised to the power of the number of edges. So this is basically the expected number of copies. And if n is a little bit bigger than 2 to the k minus 1 over 2, so it's 1 plus little 1 times this, then if you plug it here, this is 1 plus little 1 raised to the power k, and if the little o1 will be chosen appropriately, then this number is pretty big. So at least in terms of expectation, we hope, or there is a chance, to find every asymmetric graph, every graph with no automorphisms, as a subgraph. Now note that it's not the fact that the expectation is big does not necessarily mean that we will find it there, right? Or at least there is a, there is a chance to find it there. And, uh, uh, and this will be the plane here, okay? So, so here is a possible plane. We will try to prove the existence of an induced universal graph, G, for this family of all k vertices <coughs> graph, uh, by constructing graph with two pieces. So there will be a big piece that you see here and a smaller piece that you see here. The big piece will be random, so it will be a random graph, and it will contain all the asymmetric k vertex graphs. So graphs that do not have too many automorphisms, it will turn out that technically we have to define it a little bit differently, but, but the intuition is that these are the graphs that do not have many automorphisms. And then all the symmetric graphs, graphs that have lots of automorphisms, then hopefully we will be able to uh, uh, find some structured, smaller piece that will contain all of them. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try to... Uh, uh, to indeed do this. Uh, so we first have to define what we mean by symmetric and asymmetric, and it turns out that uh, because of some technical reasons, uh, this is a good definition. So I want to call a k-vertex graph asymmetric if it contains no induced subgraph with many automorphisms, and many is k to the 4m, where m is 2 square root k log k. Okay, so I don't want to have any induced subgraph in my graph that has about k to the square root k up to some logarithms automorphisms. So in particular, the graph itself does not have auto many automorphisms, so it can have k to the square root k maybe, but not more. But also, I want that every subgraph of it 
will not have too many automorphisms. And if a, <coughs> if a graph is not asymmetric, then it is called symmetric, right? So, uh, so maybe this is a symmetric graph because you see it has many pairs here that we can, uh, we can flip, so we have many automorphisms. Okay, and with this definition, uh, it turns out that uh, one can prove the following. Uh, so with high probability, if we take the random graph g n one half n labeled vertices, every pair forms an edge with probability half, and n is a little bit bigger than two to the uh, k minus one over two, so we add this uh, a negligible uh, additive error term, then it contains every k vertex uh, asymmetric graph as an induced subgraph with high probability, and uh, I'll not say uh, much about the uh, proof, so uh, we basically uh, bound the probability that a fixed such asymmetric graph does not appear as an induced subgraph by using some version of a, a large deviation inequality that is called Talagrand's inequality. We need to have some twist uh, there, and, and it's important to apply it to the correct random variable, which is not exactly the number of copies of this graph in our induced graph. But once we do it, so this is basically uh, not too complicated. There are uh, a few pages of computation, but, uh, uh, but it can be done, and, uh, and this takes care of all the asymmetric graphs. So then the question is, uh, and this was a, a more difficult uh, a part for me, and uh, maybe the more interesting one, is what happens about this uh, symmetric graph. So, so some of my initial hope, and uh, it seems uh, reasonable to expect that, uh, that maybe we can uh, apply some tools from group theory. So some results that are known about large subgroups of the symmetric group, this will be the groups of automorphisms of, of those symmetric graphs. So we will have, there will be relatively large subgroups of this uh, symmetric group uh, SK. And then maybe we will be able to uh, use this uh, uh, and get enough information to be able to construct this small piece that will contain all the symmetric graphs. And here is one example of a result that uh, uh, I thought uh, <coughs> indicated that things like that uh, could be useful. So this specific one is a result by uh, Baba uh, improving uh, uh, earlier estimates by Bochert and Prager and Suckle. And uh, uh, for those of you who are still uh, uh, not uh, sleeping, you may wonder how he managed to improve in 81 something proved in uh, 89. But actually, uh, this is a classical result, so it's from uh, 1889, and uh, <laughs> so it's possible to do it. And, uh, and the statement is, uh, uh, is the following, that uh, every primitive so primitive means a, a transitive and also a, a, that does not preserve any non-trivial partition of the ground set into blocks. But it's not so crucial, so let's say it's some property. Yeah. So every primitive subgroup of SK, of the symmetric group, which is not doubly transitive, so it does not have the properties that every pair of elements is mapped to every other pair of elements, is small, is of size, roughly the size that I want to care about, right? Exponential in, in square root k up to some logarithmic factors. Now, if we could have indeed uh, forget about primitive, then you see double transitive, maybe I wrote it here. If the automorphism group of a graph is doubly transitive, then it's very simple. It's either a clique or an independent set because every pair is moved to every other pair. So if you have an edge, then everything should be an edge. And if you have a non-edge, then everything should be a non-edge. So if we just have to take care of a clique and independent sets, then we just add them. I mean, uh, these are very few vertices to add. So, uh, so the hope was that uh, maybe, so, so of, course, of course the trouble is that we cannot assume that this is primitive. Uh, mostly the assumption that this is transitive, the group of automorphisms of a, of a graph would usually not be transitive. It's not true that every vertex is mapped to every other vertex. But still, for a while, I was hoping that I'll be able maybe to characterize uh, all the graphs that uh, 
whose groups of automorphisms is, uh, is small. And, uh, and I looked, but somehow it turns out that, uh, that there are many of those graphs. I, I wrote here uh, some, uh, uh, some example of a big class of graphs that have many automorphisms. So you just start from any graph you want. I wrote here a random graph, but any graph you want on a little smaller number of vertices. So not k, but maybe k minus, say, 8 square root k square root log k. And then you take in this graph some of its vertices and you double them. You replace each of them by an independent set of size 2 that is connected to exactly the same neighbors that the original vertex was connected. So this way you get many graphs and all of them have lots of automorphisms because every pair like this, you can, f you can switch them independently of every other. So if you have x, care, x pairs, you have 2 to the x uh, uh, automorphisms. And, uh, and this is just one example. So there are many other similarly constructed examples of families showing that you really have lots of graphs with many automorphisms. And it seems hopeless to really characterize uh, all of them. But, uh, uh, but luckily, still something can be uh, done. And, uh, and here I'll not say much, but it turns out that still we can use enough of the known structure about uh, large subgroups of the symmetric group, so basically about uh, something called the minimal degree. Uh, so <clears throat> we want to use the fact that any such subgroup contains an element which uh, uh, with support, which is a, a, so the number of elements that are not fixed uh, is a, a quite big, but still is quite far from being almost everything. And then you can use this together with this connection uh, proved uh, that I mentioned uh, before, proved by Kanan, Orr, and Rudish uh, uh, about the uh, connection between adjacency labeling scheme and universal graphs just to deduce from the group theory enough information about the graphs that will be able, will, will suffice for us to, to prove this uh, uh, second part that uh, it's not, I don't know what happened here, but uh, <coughs> uh, where, where here? Yes, that, uh, that there is an explicit graph with a uh, maybe 2 to the k over 2 divided by k squared, so much smaller number of vertices that contains all the symmetric k vertex graphs as induced subgraphs. So here there is some work to be done, and if I had more, maybe 15 more minutes, then I could have said enough to give you the impression that if I would have had 30 more minutes, then you would have been able to follow. But let me not uh, do it, so just say that this can be uh, done, and then the two theorems together give us this uh, universal graph. So let me just uh, finish with a, a few uh, uh, questions. So there are many open problems about uh, uh, universal graphs for some other families. Uh, this uh, proof that I uh, uh, kind of sketched here, it does work for several other families, but, uh, but not for many other interesting cases, and it will be interesting to uh, understand them uh, uh, more, uh, uh, somehow more thoroughly. I mean, yeah, I'm trying to focus on this uh, photo, right? So, so let me, but uh, just, uh, okay. So, uh, but, but let me still uh, uh, mention uh, uh, maybe two uh, uh, specific problems. So the first one, uh, I mean, still, we have a reasonably good estimate for this uh, minimum possible number of vertices of a graph containing every k vertex graph as an induced subgraph. And if you do the computation uh, correctly, this is basically Moon's estimate, but I just did the computation uh, uh, more accurately. This is a lower bound, this is an upper bound. There is still quite some gap, and it will be interesting to close it. In particular, it will be interesting to get something in the lower bound, which is more than just the counting argument. So this is what follows from the counting argument. Can we get something that is a uh, uh, bigger, I don't know. The second one that I wanted to mention is kind of a class of, uh, of problems, and I think it's interesting. Uh, so this is something that I want to call the vertex random graph process. So there is something that people call 
the random graph process, and uh, this has been uh, investigated quite intensively, and there are many results, and, uh, and, uh, and I want to suggest a, a kind of a, a, different, a similar model. Uh, okay, so, so consider the following uh, a model uh, that uh, you can call the vertex random graph process, so you start from a, uh, you have a <clears throat> an infinite sequence of graphs, G1, G2, G3, and so on. G1 is just a single vertex. And then GI plus one is always obtained from GI by adding one more vertex and connecting it randomly to what you had before. Every vertex that existed before, randomly and independently, let's say with probability half, you can do other probabilities also, becomes an edge. And then you can ask, uh, uh, so, so here is a, actually an example of a statement, something that uh, one can prove again using uh, this uh, uh, a connection to, a, a, to group theory. So with high probability, you look at this sec sequence, G1, G2, G, uh, and so on, and you look at the first time that you contain a clique and an independent set of size k. So this happens at some point. You fix k. At some point, your graph will contain a clique and independent set of size k. And one can show that with high probability, as soon as this happens, then it already contains all the k vertex graphs as induced subgraphs. So really, the difficult thing will be to contain the clique and the independent set. And actually, combining this with something called the Stein chain method, it implies that if n and k are such, so consider again the random graph, the usual random graph, if n choose k times two to the k, uh, to the minus k choose two is lambda, this is, means it's the expected number of clicks of size k is lambda, then the probability that gn one half contains all k versus graphs is really, we know to determine it, it's one minus e to the minus lambda square up to little one. So this is true for lambdas that tends to zero or tends to infinity or for fixed lambda. This is always true. And the reason is basically because the probability to contain a clique of size k is one minus e to the minus lambda. This is because of Stein chain. And the probability to contain an independent set of size k is one minus e to the minus lambda. And the two events are roughly independent. So we really need both of them to hold. But I think that this model, this uh, vertex random graph process, is interesting in its own. And, uh, and as I said, there is a similar model that has been investigated quite a lot. It will be nice to get uh, this, results of this type are called heating time results. That exactly when some event happens, exactly when we contain a clique and independent set, then we already contain all k vertex graphs. And you can consider some different events and uh, and try to prove that in this process, as soon as something relatively simple happens, then exactly at that time, something more complicated happens as well. So with this, let me finish, and uh, thank you for your attention. Yes, so one could try to, uh, to take different probabilities for an edge, but then you could, it's possible to show that then you, you would need exponentially main, ex, an exponentially uh, bigger number. So somehow, if you really want to contain all the graphs, then the best is to take, uh, to take a half. If we would want a family that is universal, for example, for all graphs with a, a one-third k choose two edges, then it would be natural to take a random graph with edge probability one-third. But, but for this, uh, it's best to take one half. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, yes, this may be a bit perpendicular, but uh, uh, is it possible to tell for if somebody gives you a graph if it's symmetric or asymmetric? Uh, right. Uh, so, so you mean how how efficient it is to uh, 
uh, to know if it's a... Right, so, so even finding the number of uh, automorphisms of a given graph is a... Uh, is kind of, is not known to be polynomial, but at least is not exponential, so, so it's something roughly like graph isomorphism, maybe. A, but here I'm talking also about, a, about subgraphs, a, right? And then, a, so, a, uh, yeah, so I guess I don't know anything intelligent to say about it, but uh, maybe it's interesting, <laughs> uh, right, yeah, yeah. So, so one thing that I was told once is that uh, if you don't uh, know to answer a question, uh, or you don't want to answer a question that you are being asked in lecture, then you should compliment the, the one who asked it and uh, say that this is a very good question. <laughs> but, uh, but, this is, uh, yeah. but this is really a good question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks. Uh -huh. I have a more vague question, uh, philosophical. Uh -huh. In some sense, is, is there any connection with information theory? In some sense, the information of this universal graph contains okay. just a very rough philosophic. So I would say that maybe the maybe kind of the connection to the adjacency labeling scheme says something about some connection to information, right? Because because it means uh, it tells us uh, how much information I can get from the uh, from the labels of uh, of the vertices. So this is this connection, but, uh, but maybe a shorter answer would be to say that this is also a very good question. <laughs> but, uh, but, it's, uh, okay. but, but maybe it's, uh, it's a partial answer. Okay. Thanks. Any more interesting questions or comments? <laughs> uh -huh. okay. uh, does this problem as any, well, this technique has any link with uh, Ramsey numbers? So the connection to Ramsey numbers, uh, yeah. So I think, I mean, the lower bound for Ramsey numbers uh, is proved uh, by a similar estimate as the one that estimates the biggest uh, clique in a random graph. But, uh, but here it looks that it's, uh, so maybe it's not directly related. It, uh, it is something about, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there is some, maybe I should, uh, yeah, since you're asking, uh, there is something that is known, so, uh, so Ramsey graphs are graphs on uh, n vertices in which the biggest clique and biggest independent set are of size logarithmic in n. So random graphs have this property, and, uh, and one thing that is known uh, is that Ramsey graphs, in some sense, they are somewhat universal. So they must contain, as in due subgraphs, all the graphs on some small constant times log n number of vertices. So this will not be good enough for me because it will not correspond to 2 to the k, but maybe to 100 to the k. But it means that, indeed, there is some connection, but. Uh, but maybe not directly to this specific uh, question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.